everyone to African Philosophy Conversations. Um, my name is Bruce Jans, and I'm very happy uh, to have my two guests today. This is the first time I've had two guests on uh, in this conversation. Uh, Dr. Jean Marie Jackson, uh, Associate Professor of English at Johns Hopkins University, and Dr. Omedi Ocheng, Associate Professor of Communication at Denison University. Welcome to both of you. Thanks so much, Bruce. It's great to see you guys uh, almost sort of in the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah. So I guess the place I usually like to start is to get uh, people to talk a little bit about their path into philosophy. And I think it's, uh, you know, the interesting uh, feature in this case is that neither of you are in philosophy departments, both of your training is, is in literature, and yet both of your work exhibits a great familiarity and a great sensitivity to um, philosophy in general and African philosophy in particular. And so I'd like to ask you, how did you end up, um, you know, with that interest, given your, your own backgrounds? I'll start with you, Jean Marie. Um, yeah, I had a sort of uh, traditional, non-traditional path into working with philosophy and that I was trained in a department of comparative literature um, that for many, many years, I haven't been back in some time, was seen as a kind of bastion of high theory, um, the bastion of high theory, for better or worse, before my time. Uh, so we were kind of joked about on campus as philosophy light. Um, I, I, I look at the, made that remark in a in a podcast recently, um, and there was some truth to it to the extent that we shared any language, working across a real multitude of traditions, uh, literary and intellectual and historical. It was theory, and theory, obviously, especially through the '90s. Um, edged into continental philosophy or what we would probably call continental philosophy pretty easily. Um, that said, I wasn't trained uh, as a philosopher or as an Africanist. Um, and so I came to philosophy um, in what would typically be conceived of as an analytic vein um, and to Africanist scholarship um, kind of on my own at the same time. Um, my department was extremely rigorous in its expectations of language training um, and of area specialization. So um, we were left on our own to do that however we thought made the mm -hmm. most sense for the work we wanted to do, but we had to do it in some way. Um, and philosophy was, I think, um, was to me then and these 10 or 12 years later, um, the sort of most um, uh, eclectic and yet lucid site of the African humanistic tradition that I've found. And I say that even as a literature scholar, um, mm. uh, properly speaking. So it kind of brought regional specialization um, and my kind of disciplinary uh, aspirations together, I guess you might say. And a lot of it ended up just being um, a lot of reading on my own, um, unfortunately, with some mentorship from friends who are real living, breathing philosophers. <laughs> well, so did your interest in African literature come first or your interest in African philosophy? Like, it's one thing to have an interest in philosophy. It's another thing to, you know, do this, you know, what in the kind of grand scope of philosophy is, you know, relatively smaller area compared to, let's say, ethics or epistemology mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, so how did you make that? move yeah yeah no that's, that's a good question so definitely african literature came first um i knew you know kind of at the beginning of grad school that that's what i wanted to do at least for the vast uh, majority of my research time um but in terms of theory and philosophy i i wasn't uh formally trained in it so i qualified mm -hmm. for example in hermeneutic phenomenology so i had a background in recur um specifically um was, was deeply deeply invested in hermeneutics um, and I didn't really have a way of bringing together the highest level conversations happening in African literature. And what I took at that time to be the kind of highest level, most difficult conversations that I was training myself to be part of um, in the phenomenological tradition. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, African literature as a field or subfield, whoever you want to, however you want to conceive of it, doesn't have a particularly strong uh, philosophical through line, right? Um, so I felt that I had to find a totally new lever for right. moving between right. these two uh, realms of my own intellectual right. interests. Um, right. And that lever for me specifically ended up taking the form of Kwesi Redu. Um, and the first time I read an essay by, by, by Redu, I just thought, oh my God, this is what I've been missing all of these years. 
Um, and I kind of went on from there um, and realized that that was my bridge, basically. Wow. Um, I was never going to be a hardcore recur scholar um, or, or hermeneute. And at the same time, I felt like a bit of a loner in a lot of African literature conversations, which were very much stuck at the level of terms that I wanted to get underneath, if right. that makes sense. So yeah, culture, sure. identity, history, um, which are not terms that can be taken um, at face value, you know, with any longer uh, um, uh, disciplinary or historical scope than the mid 20th century. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so philosophy gave me the, the point of contact. Right. Might say. So Dr. Cheng, let's, uh, you know, go over to you. What, what brought you into this, given um, your background in literature? Um, I suppose growing up, I was always interested in African thought. Um, but given the uh, Kenya's educational system, I was, I was born and raised in Kenya. And so given Kenya's educational system, um, I never really in learned much about African thought in the educational system. Um, I would sort of read on the side and ask a lot of questions, ask my, my parents and, and my, my family lots of questions about, um, about sort of indigenous African thought, but I would, not, I would not get it at school. And so when I went to the university, that's where I really started getting a, a sense of, of African thought. Um, and, and then um, in the United, university, I studied communication um, mm -hmm. because I, I've always wanted, I, I think from, from the time I was very young, I, I, I always wanted to be a writer. I always sort of thought I would be a writer of some sort um, and just not fiction as well as I wanted to write um, political commentary. I remember reading newspapers and wanting to write political commentary. Right. So really, what really came first for me always has, all, has been a sense of wanting to be a writer, of wanting to write. Mm. Um, and then I went to graduate school in the United States. Uh, I came to graduate school in the United States. And um, that's where, I, for the first time, there was a sense that I had to make a choice um, mm. because I now realize this was a subject matter. There's a subject matter called philosophy, and you can study it and you can um, graduate in it. And um, and I, I, I was actually admitted in graduate school as a as a rhetor in rhetoric, uh, sort of it, to to be a rhetorician. And um, and then I ended up trying to take some classes in the philosophy, mm -hmm. the philosophy department. Um, and I quickly realized very soon that that it was I was not welcome there. Um, <laughs> I, I quickly realized that African philosophy was dismissed, and I myself, my body was yeah. I was seen as a, a foreign a foreign. Right. Um, so um, and so I was still interested in philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and I, I ended up taking some <laughs> classes in philosophy, in the philosophy department, even though, all, even though it was um, many times just hostile territory. Hmm. Um, but um, I quickly came to sort of distinguish, and I, I, I continue to hold this notion. I, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad that now I've that I've read Sylvia Winter, she also affirms that notion, that there's a distinction between philosophy and thought. And I, I really do see myself as a person who studies thought in mm. general. Um, and that philosophy is um, one significant, um, one significant line or, or strain of thought. Um, that is not, I don't think, in my view, should not be conflated with thought as such. Mm. Um, so I, I always try to make that distinction that I, insofar as I see myself, I study thought, and that may include philosophy, but that's, they're not the same things. Well, you know, I'm really interested. Um, first, I, I, I taught briefly in Kenya, and so I, I, I know what you're saying about some of the exposure that 
people have uh, within the Kenyan educational system to, um, you know, to philosophy, it can be pretty scant. Um, I think I lost you there. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, what I was saying is that I taught briefly in the Kenyan, uh, um, you know, system. I taught at University of Nairobi briefly. And uh, so I'm certainly aware of what you're saying about uh, the exposure that students would get to, um, you know, to philosophy in that system. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested, I guess, from a philosopher's point of view, you've both talked about, uh, you know, how you approached philosophy from a, from a person trained in literature or rhetoric. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Jackson, you talked about the, you know, the, the sense that foundational terms were not being interrogated well enough. Um, you know, Dr. Chang, you've talked about um, the way that there's something um, uh, about thought that was not being well enough uncovered, you know, and I think about it from a philosopher's side, you know, I'm thinking, let's take a Kenyan figure like, uh, uh, like Odera Aruka, who has this very famous uh, uh, trends of African philosophy. And he starts out with four of those. And later on, he adds two more. And one of those two is what he calls literary um, philosophy, right? And by it, he means to uh, you know, include people like Okat Batek and Chinu Achebe and Wally Shoyenka and Taban Loliong and, you know, lots of people we could think of that are not just um, fiction writers or story writers, but they also do essays. And some of these essays he wants to say come close to being philosophy, but you always get the sense from Aruka that, but no, not really. It's not really philosophy. <laughs> It's just like, you know, when literary folks want to dabble in something a little bit deeper than telling stories, uh, this is what they do. And I've always been a little bit uncomfortable with that kind of dismissive attitude. And so maybe I guess, you know, what I want to ask you is about that borderland between literature and philosophy within, within African space. W what does that borderland look like to, to each of you? Is that is that, a, is that a hostile space? I know, Dr. Ocheng, you, you talked about it as being quite hostile when you started taking philosophy courses. Um, now, you know, is, does Aruka's depiction have any merit to it or, or do you see it differently than that? Dr. Ocheng, I'll start with you. Yeah. So uh, I am one of the people who doesn't think that Aruka's four trends is a very good way of, um, that, that that those analytical categories are, are are helpful. I don't think they are very helpful. Um, in part because I see sort of a confusion between um, subject matter and institutional embeddedness. Okay. Right. So uh, there's sort of you know if we are going to talk about institutional embeddedness, I'd rather a lot of ethno so-called ethno philosophers were were actually were actually academics. Right. So I would like I would like sort of a notion here that that sort of says that um, and Oruka himself, you know, I, he sort of distinguishes, he sort of says sage philosophy is one and then there's professional philosophy. Well, Oruka right. himself was a professional philosopher. Sure. So I, I've never felt that he's um, that those distinctions that that the, that the four trends are a very good analytical um, that they serve a very good analytical purpose. Um, if you look at the work of, let's say just we read the work of Oyeumi on gender, um, on Kirun Zegu on philosophy and art and gender, on Wole Shoinka on art and um, myth and, and philosophy, hmm. or you look at the work of um, even Senghor, right? Um, one of the arguments that comes up constantly is this pushback that there's some that that there's this there's this notion that there's some trans trans historical essence to what gender is or religion is or philosophy is. In other words, that that the way that the the North Atlantic world curves up the world into this is religion, this is art. This is philosophy. This is literature. Um, is a very historical. It's it's actually a very historical modern notion. It's not. It doesn't 
hold forever and everywhere across the world. That there are other ways of thinking about the relationship between, I mean, there are other ways of thinking about what, what religion is, right? Or maybe that there's no other, there's no sort of no such singular category. So what I'm trying to say then is that um, I think there was a missed opportunity during the post-independence period for what we know now as professional philosophy in Africa mm. and Africana to start thinking in other ways about um, how we uh, analyze the world, how we categorize the world, and in some ways to push back against and even critique the, 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 the analytical categories mm that the North Atlantic world um, saw as natural and, 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 and imposed as natural. Dr. Jackson, what do you? Um... I think I have a, a kind of interestingly different view from this. And it's something that Amhedi and I will have to uh, talk about uh, for, for years to come, I, I suspect, um, which is that while I don't necessarily sign on to Aruka's categories, um, I do think that they're useful. And I think that they're useful in the way that sort of taxonomical scholarship is often useful, which is that it gives you a starting point and taxonomies are at their best there to be played with and muddled. Um, I've done a lot of work in the Zimbabwean literary and intellectual tradition and the critic who often gets um, hit with the same criticism is George Kahari, right? Who wrote this foundational book dividing the Zimbabwean novel into, I forget how many uh, groups basically um, of, of determina or determinations. Um, and it's the same thing, they're not adequate, right? But, but, but they at least give us something to hold on to um, when we start figuring out what larger categories or um, more interstitial categories we would like to work with in advance. Um, so I think that in Aruka's work in particular, the literary, uh, that comes out, he, he ends up adding to, right? It's been a while since I've read it, but he adds hermeneutic and then literary and artistic expression is the last and separate one. It's obviously a little bit of an afterthought, right? And when you read it, I had the sense that it's kind of like, hey, I'm interested in Achebe. I want this to be in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> I actually don't think that Achebe is a particularly philosophical novelist. And he uses the example, as I recall, of things fall apart. And I want to be very clear that I don't think that's some sort of pejorative um, uh, reception of his work. I don't think that novels have to be philosophical to succeed at doing many, many things that novels do, right? right. right. Um, and so I think Aruka's distinction, which people in my experience are often surprised when they actually read him in full to go back and find, because it seems almost you know, Handanchi-esque uh, between sage philosophy and, and folk wisdom, mm -hmm. again, can be useful if mm -hmm. you don't think that philosophy being delineated in some minimally exclusive sense is, is, a, is a threat mm -hmm. um, to other kinds of discourse and thought. And I think that that's where Almedi's earlier comment, which I, I jotted down to myself, is really, really, uh, really fruitful. That he said he's thought, right? And philosophy, um, in the most humble sense, is one kind of thought that should rightly be positioned uh, interrelationally with other kinds of thought. Um, and if you don't assume that philosophy, however defined, has a hierarchical relationship, with those other kinds of thought, then the need to maximally define philosophy kind of goes away. Um, does that make sense? I had a friend in graduate school who said to me, who is now like a really amazing um, uh, labor legal theorist, Hiba, if you're out there, shout out <laughs> to your much more astonishing career than mine. Um, but she said to me once when I was trying to, I was, I was angry at kind of um, realism not having uh, uh, enough included in it. She said, look, if everything's realism, nothing is. <laughs> and it always stuck with me, right? I mean, if everything's philosophy, then, 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 then nothing is. Right, right. And I think it's also a matter of disciplinary starting point and disciplinary home, where right. friends of mine who are trained as philosophers and in philosophy, I can completely see on an institutional level, frankly, uh, on what is often a sort of um, level of, of social uh, positionality even why you would want philosophy to be maximally defined because that's doing um, very specific institutional um, uh, redress. Right. I think from my point of view in literature where it's like we live in the interstices, you know, we, 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 we live in spaces of minimal definition. 
that for me, it can be useful to have something working in the other direction saying, all right, all right, but if pressed, um, where do you want to sort of draw these lines? And then I try to balance like a ping pong ball in between, if that, <laughs> uh, yeah, I no, that that's intelligible to you. Sure. Imagine. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I mean, what strikes me, you know, and I'm glad Sanghor came up because I want to, you know, think about think about this, not just in terms of literature specifically, but about the aesthetic, right, which I know, Dr. Cheng, you've written extensively about, um, you know, I mean, the thing that strikes me about Aruka's taxonomy is that it's not just a, um, you know, a, a, a categorization of things, it comes with normative content. It's like, this is the real thing, and all this rest of this stuff is not really you know, it stands in some relationship to, you know, what the real thing is, which for him is sage philosophy, right? And, you know, it, you know, going over to someone like Senghor, um, you know, I'm just struck by the uses of the aesthetic within an African context often. I mean, you know, the old discourse around negritude was, um, you know, that the aesthetic was African and the discursive was European, right? So, so you know, the, the poetry of Senghor was trying to evoke this the rhythmic, um, you know, sensibility, the certain kind of aesthetic, which was supposedly missing from, you know, uh, from uh, um, European or Western uh, settings. And this was supposed to be the thing that differentiates. Clearly, it's also a normative content, right? It's also not as good, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's going on in the back of everyone's mind. Okay, you know, yeah, we can see a difference and we'll give them this, but it's not as good. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that strikes me as, as a kind of you know, uh, maybe I won't say typically philosophical, but there's a certain kind of philosophical approach which wants to put philosophy on a pedestal and to say philosophy is the best thinking we can do and everything else comes below that. And I'm wondering how you navigate that kind of thing as people both trained in, in literature and aesthetics more generally and also uh, knowledgeable about philosophy. How do you, how do you get, get with, past the arrogance of philosophers, I guess I'll say? <laughs> I thought you want to go, Jean Marie. <laughs> I, I I just go and I'll say that I think, insofar as anytime somebody sort of uses philosophy as an honorific of some kind, um, that's what I would be critical of. Mm -hmm. Um, that philosophy is seen as as such, such some kind of um, some kind of status. You know, I'm a philosopher, or this is this is some this is real thought. Um, but 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 if it's just used then as a, a descriptor of some kind of practice, some kind of activity, mm. um, maybe even maybe even an intellectual tradition, mm. um, then that's that's wonderful. Yeah, that that means then that um, as Sylvia Winter again points out, yeah. There are other, other ways of thinking. Actually, Winter does think that um, philosophy, um, and, and she's sort of interested here in, in, in its historical uh, emergence and its, its historical movement, is a, a very provincial term insofar mm -hmm. as it's not attuned to, um, it's not attuned to other ways of thought, mm -hmm. you know, other traditions of thought. So I guess I would I would again say that, yeah, I am just I would be critical of and I push against honorific uses of philosophy or, or uh, honorific sort of notions of what philosophy is. Yeah. But otherwise, um, I am very interested in philosophy. I study phil philosophers. I I've learned a lot from philosophers, and and I think yes. So I, I don't necessarily. Um, when I talk about that distinction between thought and philosophy, that's what I was really coming back to, that I, I think that thought outstrips or goes beyond what it, just this one notion of it. I think that's really, really well put. Um, I had uh, honorific. And I think that um, coming from a comparative literature department, coming from a home base in literary studies, where there's this panoply of methodologies and approaches and where we're constantly in the midst since I've been in it, of <laughs> disciplinary and self-definitional crisis, um, I'm able to approach philosophy without some of that baggage, right? That honorific and sort of status baggage where I, 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 it seems ridiculous to me. <laughs> I mean, so 
for a long time, philosophy was positioned for a long time, essentially, in, uh, in, in print terms forever, right, since Aristotle, um, as a hostile interlocutor with, with good literature. And that tradition right. goes all the way up, arguably, to someone like San Guy, thinking about the novel of ideas, um, you know, where for philosophy to be literary in Nietzsche or Kierkegaard, it has to interrupt itself right. and encompass these sort of little novels. And then the stuff I'm interested in most recently in my own work is when that flips or inverts and you see novels kind of interrupting themselves to encompass what is clearly marked as philosophy. And there are many critics who would read that as awkward, right? Um, as uh, stylistically oh, 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 gauche. Um, and it is by no means a given that when I write about African novels of ideas, that those are superior in terms of, let's say, stylistic achievement, um, affective expression, right? Um, um, historical insight even to novels or literature more broadly uh, refracted through a different lens or frame. And so I think for me, there's just like a, a humility toward philosophy built in to not having been trained as a philosopher, but nonetheless having found something that was missing from my own training in philosophy, again, a little bit more narrowly defined, by which I essentially mean people who have called themselves philosophers yeah. and glommed on to something like a philosophical tradition um, by name, right? So again, a fairly minimal threshold, but I think one that is um, nonetheless useful. Um, and I think it's interesting that even within African philosophy, within the larger ambit of philosophy, where you see that honorific, that kind of real thing can shift. Um, so as you indicated, Bruce, it's not that Aruka sees philosophy as a number one kind of thought, it's an even professional philosophy, right. which he calls is subsidiary to sage philosophy. Right. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you're constantly working with idiosyncratic versions of this perceived hierarchy. Um, and I think that sometimes even can be a better way into a conversation about, well, what do you mean by this right. Right. Um, than even using a term as broad as like philosophy, capital P. But I'm not trained in the analytic tradition, right? I can't hold my own in these classes. <laughs> I sit there like, what the hell equation was I just supposed to, was yeah. supposed to write? Um, so I, 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 I have very modest ambitions as well, far as you know, um, it's, philosophy it's philosophy. is concerned. It's philosopher's trial by fire, you know, like, you know, if you're in psychology, you have to take stats and that's the weed out stuff. And in philosophy, yeah. it's it's yeah. logic. But, you know, I'm glad you brought us to uh, your recent work, because I actually wanted to 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 get us to think about that in both of your cases, actually, you know, I mean, in your recent uh, book, African Novel of Ideas, you really take a kind of novel uh, or interesting approach, novel approach to, um, you know, to how philosophy relates to literature, which is that you know, oftentimes people might think of the relationship between literature and philosophy is that the, the literature represents the philosophy in some way. In other words, it, you know, it encompasses uh, ethical dilemmas, let's say, or it encompasses, you know, some kind of content that can be used, let's say, in a classroom to talk about some specific, you know, epistemological problem or metaphysical problem or whatever. And you seem to talk about it in a very different way, that kind of interface between philosophy and, and, and literature. So can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely right. And I'm very gratified to have had you as a reader and that you got that because um, the thing that I knew I would get when I first started giving talks on the book material and that I did in fact get, and sometimes it was useful, sometimes less so, was, well, is it X philosophical? Is it Y philosophical? Right. Uh, you know, why isn't Tram 83 philosophy? And, and you're just like, I mean, again, this issue of, okay, if, if, if we make the definition so maximal that it can be literally any book with what, um, uh, Emmanuel Tricurieze might have called an implicit philosophy, right. then how can I write a, a book in turn that right. says anything, right? Um, and for me, a lot of what uh, philosophy as a demarcated intellectual and yeah, professional tradition um, provided me was, 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 was traction. Mm -hmm. um, and working in the halls of high theory, I often just felt like I was floating in, in the ether, you know, like, okay, what are we actually talking about here? Um, and wanting a, a, a point of return, um, definitional return from what was nonetheless sometimes a kind of bracing um, heaviness mm -hmm. to certain kinds of discourses that I was trained in. Um, and so what I wanted to identify was a genealogy, uh, loosely put, of African writers 
who were um, invoking philosophy qua philosophy, right? Invoking philosophy as a formally distinct practice um, that could then be encased in a novel. Um, quite the way, or again, a kind of inverted way that Nietzsche or Kierkegaard to take the two most prominent and, and foundational examples of the philosophical novel that I teach in my classes, previously encased the novel as this polyvocal right. but separate thing right. in their works of philosophy. So what about that was of some use to these writers in their particular social and historical positions? And what that meant to me was that I was able to watch African novelists grappling with ideas as such, by which I mean the questions, um, uh, like a lot of Lovejoy criticism gets at this, for example, of does an idea have an ontology, for example, right? Does an idea take up space? Mm. Um, what is the relationship between an idea and a concept? Uh, Peter Dubola's work, what's the relationship between an idea and a word? Um, how are ideas syntactic? All of these really quite technical questions, questions of arra uh, arrangements of choreography on a page, how are African novelists doing that? And that to me is a more um, um, apprehendable question, mm -hmm. right? It's a question that I was able to feel more traction with mm -hmm. um, than uh, a question of deriving an implicit philosophy from essentially any manner of novelistic presentation. Um, so I hope that that kind of gives some more insight into what I, I, I saw myself as, as reading. Yeah. Yeah. Um, more than what I was doing myself, but what, yeah. I, what I was picking up on. Yeah, no, that's that's really great. And I think it really gives a different kind of path for a philosopher to think about how they might engage with, um, you know, with, with the novel. You know, Dr. Cheng, I want to, you know, there, this this kind of interestingly, you know, each of you segue for, for the other one, which is great. Um, you know, in your book, um, The Intellectual Imagination, uh, Knowledge and Aesthetics in North Atlantic and, and African Philosophy, um, you know, I love what you do in that book in terms of thinking about, and this feels like a theme in your in your work, thinking about the good life, thinking about how how we how we could live, what you know how we could think in order to live better. Um, you know, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, you know that that notion of the, uh, that you use the foretaste of the good life. Is that you know sometimes when I think about literature it's it's uh it, you know it can be utopian it can be you know it can give us a, a foretaste in the sense of let's construct an imaginary world and imagine ourselves as characters within that world but that it strikes me that's not exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about the foretaste of a good life so so what are you talking about with that and you know does it connect up with what dr jackson just talked about in this kind of path into you know the novel as philosophy that's not just representational right right um that's yeah that's actually a, a tough question i know um, it is <laughs> i i think a lot about it and i have on any, on any given day i would have a different answer <laughs> for, for it um so i i suppose i want to move in Two levels without trying to be too. I, I don't want to. I hope I'm not too. Uh, I don't end up rambling, but I would say, on one level, I would say that I think that there has been sometimes a, a long, sometimes fruitful, many times not fruitful um, debate um, in uh, sort of engaging that question of representations, how, uh, how African literature or African art represents Africa, right? And I've not always found it um, always fruitful insofar as sometimes it then that notion of representation is all about, let's have positive representations of Africa or let's have wholesome representations of Africa. Um, and th there can be, you know, a too vulgarized notion of what literature does. Um, Insofar as I think a sophisticated theory of literature or of, uh, of art can do, it's, I think, for me, a question of um, to what extent can um, literature stage uh, an encounter with what I'm thinking of as the antinomies of the imagination? And the, the first antinomy of the imagination that we often think of is 
form form and content, right? Um, but I think that within that antinomy, antinomy, there is always within it a uh, um, an entanglement with a, ramif a, a ramifying of certain uh, other antinomies, such as, for instance, uh, the, the one that uh, is not said a lot, but it's there, the antinomy of, um, in economics of labor and capital. Mm. Um, in the political level, we know the antinomy of the individual and society. Um, at the existential level, uh, uh, one can argue there's sort of an antinomy of um, um, freedom and necessity, for instance. Um, and those antinomies, in my view, are not transhistorical. They are very much historical. They are very much sort of rooted in a very particular kind of world that we are living in, which, which for me is a capitalist world, mm -hmm. a world of global capital. Um, and so um, the, the question then is, um, to what extent can literature in staging, in staging or, and helping us think through, with, against um, those antinomies? Um, I mean, what, what, what can literature reveal and help us think? How, how can it help us think through and with those antinomies? And one of the things that I, again, I, will all, I, I tend to go back again to a lot of uh, Marxist criticism that points to um, the importance here of uh, derefication of, of sort of um, um, critiquing um, in some form or, or helping us work through in some form the ways that um, capitalism naturalizes this, naturalizes this, um, this antinomies that we think of. Mm -hmm. And, and to, 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 I mean, I think that there can be, there can be vulgar ways in which literature can do this. So one vulgar way is through certain genre conventions such, such as the marriage plot, say romance. Romance can sort of um, synthesize or resolve some of these antinomies. But I think there are also more sophisticated ways. Um, so when I read, for instance, somebody like um, Yvonne Adhiambo Wars Dust, uh, Dust, um, her, her wonderful, excellent book. Um, I'm thinking about how that novel, for instance, um, in one way is walking through um, certain, um, certain antinomies, certain questions that are, um, that, 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 for instance, uh, the national question of Kenya, for instance, like um, the question of um, to what extent can we think of Kenya as a, as a nation? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, um, and, and for me, that, that brings up other questions I have um, insofar as if that if that is the sort of horizon of the novel, if that's one of the horizons of the novel, um, at least of, of Adhiambo Wall's novel, um, to what extent is that enabling and in what ways is that also limiting? Um, because it's also limits in, in, in some ways, I, I think that, that the novel struggles with, um, the, the novel stages the, the sort of the, the 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 national question about Kenya, but it's also in some ways um, I don't think can quite think its way out mm -hmm. of that horizon. It's still mm -hmm. stuck in that that horizon. Um, so when I think then about um, what my book was trying to stage was the, was um, that we cannot we we cannot be stuck in this stage of thinking that the novel, um, at least on a so sophisticated level, um, is, should be vulgarly representational, should be sort of uh, uh, a way in which uh, we, we sort of pose the, the question of, say, Africa as a question of, um, is it portrayed um, right. in positive ways or is it portrayed in negative ways? That's, right. um, 
that that may be too vulgar or that may be too um, unsophisticated. And there's, there's there are deeper questions that we can ask. Um, and I think some of those questions, for instance, in the work of Jean Marie, you can see some 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 of that sort of work of thinking mm -hmm. that we can we can pose different questions. Yeah, you know, I think I mean that's really fascinating because it, it, it's. I mean, maybe we could distinguish, and I know you do this, Dr. Jackson, between the kind of world world image of African literature and the local, more local, uh, uh, locally consumed, if you wish, uh, African literature. But you know, it seems to me quite often the depiction of Africa is that representation, or it's a representation of the past. I mean, if you're not talking about colonialism, if you're not talking about you know the struggle to overcome, is it really African, right? And, and I'm struck by, um, you know, somebody like, uh, and, and, you know, she's not African, but she's part of the diaspora, Suzanne Césaire, who was the spouse of, of Amy Césaire, uh, you know, and, and her take on negritude writing, which, you know, I mean, most of negritude leans into surrealism, but she really leans into surrealism. And there's that sense that surrealism gives something that's, you know, maybe trying to get past what you were talking about, past that you know, you know, if we have these antinomies, what do we do with them? How do we get past them? Do we just, you know, create an imaginative space that's really not feasible in some way? And, and you know, for her, I think surrealism gives that door into really into a future, right? Mm -hmm. And see, it strikes me as one of the real strengths of, uh, of literature that it doesn't have to leave us with, you know, something static or something, you know, here's the logical conclusion of where we are right now, or, you know, uh, or, you know, you're not really African unless you're representing, uh, you know, the history of colonialism or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's not really questioned there, but it just strikes me that, you know, what you're saying, yeah. I think really resonates. Well, no, but I mean, I think I may have said a couple of things that, that, that bear a little fleshing out. Um, well, first of all, Antinomies of the Imagination is your next book title. I said it here first. <laughs> okay, I'm waiting for this. I'm assigning this. Um, um, but but it, it, it's a great phrase. Um, and the reason that a lot of African literature, I don't know if you want to call them debates or conversations, it depends who you're, who you're talking about, kind of stall out. Um, and the reason that I, 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 you know, I, I did sort of turn to philosophy and African philosophy as um, a, a more robust space, not philosophy, the whole discipline, but African philosophy specifically, which is very marginalized, you know, in a lot of ways within the, the philosophical discipline, um, is for precisely the reasons that Amedi is talking about, um, this idea of kind of representation imagined in a kind of vulgar sense with um, one version as well, I, I, I'm just telling stories. And your stories could be very good and very interesting and I will you know, teach them in some context and certainly enjoy reading them. I'm not trying to be um, mean, uh, but it, it does wind up in this, this, well, image of Africa, right? The idea of Africa and not in this kind of deeper kind of Mudimbian sense, um, but is the portrayal poverty porn or is it not poverty porn, right? Um, all of these questions that just end up, just, they just flip flop back and forth. Um, and another version of this is the African languages question. Um, and over and over again in sort of literature circles, you get, well, we're going to revivify the field by talking about the need to write in African languages. And I think that writing in African languages is in some way neither here nor there. And, and I say this as someone who, who, who is deeply committed to, to three African languages or two, depending on how you would uh, see Af Afrikaans. Um, and it's only in philosophy, in African philosophy, again, let me correct myself because they're not quite the same, that I found really, really um, worked through conversations of, okay, African languages, but to what end, right? To what epistemological end? Um, I mean, in Wojtyla's work, it's not that she is just, we should write in tree because it makes us more Ghanaian, right? It's arguable. Um, it's, well, what does tree perform syntactically that is giving us a sort of cosmological scaffolding that then, and that's not even enough for him, that then takes us to a place of thinking about, well, as an evaluative uh, thinker, so which is what philosophers are to Oredu, right? Kind of fundamentally evaluative. At the end of the day, which cosmology from this arrangement of them derived through language do we prefer? It just goes so many steps further than African languages are good, 
right? Or um, no, English is also an African language. And it's like, how many times can, can, can we go through um, these moves? And so what you get by putting literature and philosophy, African philosophy, um, into conversation, into some kind of relationship, is that you can have the formal embodiment of African language work sometimes, or certainly work in, inflected by African grammars, certainly work inflected by African uh, uh, um, cosmologies, but then take it to this philosoph African philosophical tradition that's saying, okay, and then what, right? And then what do we do with that? Right. Um, and so that as a team, these fields or, or subfields or, or you know, terrains of thinking or whatever can kind of get past the impasse of uh, what Omedi called kind of vulgar representationalism. And I think that is um, long overdue <laughs> and is something that I'm so excited to kind of be doing with a scholar like Omedi. Yeah, well, and it reminds me a little bit of, you know, some of the recent work of someone like Suleiman Bashir Dianya, who yeah, uh, has been has been leaning into questions around translation, yeah. right? So, and translation, not just as, you know, the difficulties of it, which you often saw in, in some of the conversations around African philosophy, including in Weridu, actually, uh, you know, you can't really translate one language to another, or really, not really easily, you know, uh, um, his interest is more what, how is this moment a creative moment? How is the moment of translation something that can actually bring us something new? Um, it's a moment of encounter, it's a moment of rethinking, it's a moment, uh, you know, and so, um, so, so then African languages matter in a different way in that context. They're not just, exactly. we're, we're reaching to some notion of authenticity, you know, like d digging deep down into like the real pre-colonial, you know, uh, essence of whatever, rather it's something that's building towards a possible future. Yeah. Well, and, and I think it's, you know, important to note that obviously African languages and, um, you know, um, as a, as a cultural, uh, culturally restitutive practice as I think at their best, you know, kind of anti-capitalist practice, which is not to say African language use is always anti-capitalist and is 100% not what I mean. Um, but you know, that, that, that is valuable. I just don't necessarily think it's, it's valuable in the same way as uh, literature at its best, right? And certainly not as philosophy at its best. And I don't think there's any harm in distinguishing between practices that we invite into our, our families and into our lives um, for more straightforward reasons. And then what we really wanna have um, our engagements surround in um, a more self-consciously intellectual or academic domain. So, um, yeah, I, I think I resonate <laughs> largely um, with what's said here. Um, I just want to go back a little bit, uh, if if we could, uh, Bruce, on on that question because um, I'm really glad you brought up Cicere. And one of the books that um, I that one of the books that really helped me think about negritude, for instance, um, is 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 a person you've just mentioned, uh, Suleiman Bashir Jan's um, African Art as Philosophy. Yes. And I like that book, um, partly because, um, so for, for many reasons, but one of the things that, that he does in that book is, um, so the book is looking at the work of Senghor and, and sort of the book sort of um, rereads, helps us reread Senghor um, because in many ways, Senghor said a lot of things that were, um, that, that to me are, are wrong, right? Some of the things, for instance, one of the things that Senghor says is that there's this sort of distinction. Um, so African, um, so if we sort of make that distinction between the West and Africa, um, we're gonna find a, a notion here of, um, when we think about Africa as, you know, if, if the West is reason, <laughs> If the West is reason, Africa is in a sense affect, right? Africa is emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, showing car and uh, many others, but one of the things, one of the wonderful things that showing cars work, for instance, does in, for instance, in myth literature and the African world does is offer a really good critique of Senghor mm -hmm. uh, and of, of Senghor's notion, a version of negritude, right? Um, uh, and, and sort of uh, 
shows shows the ways that Senghor in many ways is um, ends up conceding too much uh, and ends up taking on some of the very same um, some of the same discourses that he was also interested in pushing back against. Um, and what Jan does in this book, though, is I like it because Jan what I love the way that Jan rereads Senghor and helps us start thinking about Senghor from sort of from an immanent perspective, yes. right? And maybe this is also resonating very much with, with what um, with Jen Maria has just mentioned, that there's a need here. There's, there are a lot of these thinkers that we think we know, and maybe because we think we know, and, and this is the nature of discourse. Discourse makes us take this sort of intellectual shortcuts. Like, you know, is it a good representation of Africa or is it bad? You know, people, posture and people position themselves. Right. And the, the value of African art as philosophy is, it says, let's read slowly. Let's mm -hmm. read carefully. Um, let's read systematically, right? Um, and I think I to take two things from this. That one, um, Sengo, I, I th thinks that at least, the, the, um, yeah, Sengo thinks that African art is philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, and that helps me also sort of, again, say that we can think about these categories in very many different ways. We don't have to be stuck with that older one. Um, I don't like Sengo's move um, to scaffold African art and African ways, practices too strongly to this metaphysical um, vital force ontology. Um, I don't think it's, it holds across Africa. I think that in many ways, it's a, a shortcut of its own. Um, but um, I, I, I think that, um, I don't have to. I don't have to affirm that that sort of metaphysics or that sort of ontology to say that um, maybe there's something here that we need to look at. Mainly, for instance, um, a way of reading, mm -hmm. a way of affirming certain things that are are that can be easily dismissed as either too um, too blurry or um, uh, as as lower than as as secondary to such as affect or emotion, so I can take certain things from Sengo sure. without necessarily buying into that metaphysical canopy that he wants to sort of hold. And yeah, so I, I mentioned this just because I think there's there's work this work to be done here, and Jan helps us see how we can yeah. some of the ways we can do that work. Yeah, I just I, I, want to that really, really quickly because I, I just I love I mean, I've just finished a kind of reread of Gary Wilder's Freedom Time, oh, which yeah. I'm sure great book you guys know. Right. And just by thinking about, uh, um, you know, uh, less intuitive definitions or um, contextualizations of earlier projects of, of sovereignty um, and some of the work I'm doing right now. And and I think he he reads it really well there as kind of negritude doesn't need to be taken on its metaphysical terms to understand the uh, necessity right or conditions of the emergence of a metaphysics yeah. um and that's yeah it, so, so, so basic but it's not you know i mean it really right. needed the the book um but i think to amedi's point about the ways that we can um I mean, ultimately going back to the very beginning of your last remark committee the ways that literature can help direct us and how to read philosophy rather than just vice versa which is what i take you to be sort of um, um really uh, digging into I still follow, I, I'm, I just, everything he writes, I think I just wish I could enshrine or frame um, Emmanuel Aze's um, exposition of being a historical philosopher, or actually the historical approach, he calls it, right? I was reading some of it again last night and wrote it down. Um, and he says, you know, I shall call this the historical approach, right? It's a yet another way to approach the question of African philosophy. I mean, it's my preferred way. Um, and, you know, his, lodestar as an idea is that philosophy, um, metaphysics, abstraction, right? Philosophy, even at its most kind of um, um, intangible, shall we say, is an historical phenomenon, right? And so for me, 
the bottom line is, well, abstraction is historical. Abstraction is material. Even abstraction is always in a context. Um, and what does the novel as a form do, yeah. if not that? Um, I won't go so far as to say all novels, but I think pretty damn close, right? <laughs> um, contextualize abstraction and to pick up on another one of Amendi's term, kind of systematized and uh, systematized in a constrained way, systematized abstraction. And I think right there you see the novel as a kind of philosophical um, um, teaching canvas, right? Teaching palette, um, even if it's not presented that way e explicitly. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think sometimes philosophers, when they're doing what they do, think that, you know, what we do first is define a set of concepts, you know, define our starting point. And those definitions have no rhetoric to them, have no context to them. They're, you know, here they are, and then we proceed from there. And, you know, even on, on the notion of vitalism, for example, that was already brought up. Uh, I mean, I think there's, there's, um, you know, a way of, of thinking through that that's, that's quite different from, you know, that kind of metaphysical version that we got, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's more than one version of vitalism, in other words, right? And in fact, this has been documented by various people. And so, and, and I think, you know, Dianya tries to do that. I try and do that as well by moving vitalism more into a cognitive uh, space and into a space of, of complexity theory rather than into a kind of metaphysical space that posits you know, spirits or whatever it's supposed to posit, um, you know, and so I think there are ways in, if we give up that notion that philosophers are starting from this, you know, starting point that goes beyond any context, any rhetoric, any, you know, anything and is just there. And then we can go from there and realize that, you know, what I'm taking from what both of you are saying that we never leave that space, right? Mm -hmm. We never, ever leave that space. And in some ways that's okay. And that's what novels help us think through. Uh, you know, present us with a, a set of ways of thinking about even metaphysical concepts, even, you know, philosophical concepts that we thought were beyond that. And we come to realize, no, they're not actually. No, they're well, not. And also cosmologies are, are, are right. systematizable. I right. think one thing that I, I find very um, worrying is when African cosmologies, kind of like language stuff, will get invoked right. as these escape valves. Right. Oh, if we have right. African cosmology, it's big and, and almost vaporous and then you don't have to do any systematizing work. That's right. nonsense, right? I mean, right. and you go back to some, I mean, uh, Kwame Apia's, um, some of his earlier comparative work on, on Sun Sun, for example, um, and the Akan tradition right. and the relationship between Sun Sun and Okra. Um, I mean, th 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 this is really in highly particular um, yeah actually quite rule bound stuff right. and i you know i'm not an expert in 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 more than maybe one or two barely african cosmologies but i think that's that's largely true um and so the fact that novels have to be reliant upon uh coordination of elements right that you are always reading kind of uh you know more or less elaborate choreographic performances Right. is very helpful in thinking about um, right. philosophy, again, even at its most, it's, it, it, it's most abstract as needing to have those, those footholds, right? Needing to have this sort of yeah. Um, um, systematic dimension. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so can you tell me a little bit about your recent work on Casely Hayford and how this fits into what we've been talking about? You had, you know, um, he made an appearance in uh, African Novel of Ideas, and now I understand you are, um, you know, doing a whole book on him. So does this extend that kind of argument that you've been making in that in, in African Novel of Ideas? And, and if so, how? Yes and no. I mean, in some ways, it's the dream trajectory is that you're writing a chapter of one book and you realize, oh, no, right. it has to give birth. You know, <laughs> what have I what have right. I gotten myself into? Right. Um, so certainly the research in a practical sense grew out of the, the work and the research on the African novel of ideas. Um, that said, I think without even realizing it, I had often imagined that, you know, by the time you get to a third book, you write the really voluminous crazy thing like I'm gonna write about the history of the soul in the world <laughs> and like I, I don't I love some of those books or or I'm gonna write I'm, I'm gonna like a Charles Taylor kind of tone yeah. <laughs> philosopher not 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 dictator I have to yeah know. right I, I feel like in this crowd it's not necessarily a given very which important, you're, you're very important yes. 
I have actually been in situations where people have not known which one I was referring to. So, <laughs> um, and in fact, I found myself, you could say, working in the opposite direction where um, I've narrowed my aperture hmm. a bit in some obvious senses to focus on one career um, just because I realized that, okay, I'm deeply fascinated in the biography of his moment, not hmm. just in Casely Hayford's intellectual output, but also in uh, futurities that don't come to pass. Hmm. Um, and in, in, in futurities that don't come to pass that I want to add, did nonetheless, for a time, take on some amount of concrete form. And I mean concrete extremely literally in case Lee mm. Hayford's case. This was a man who was not only a prodigious intellectual, um, you know, kind of numerous major nonfiction treatises, treatises um, that were mixed with all kinds of what we might call literary or even fictional speculation, including his novel, Ethiopia Unbound. Um, but essays on uh, major transformations in mission Christianity and the rise of West African Pentecostalism, um, but also someone who was involved in making sure that roads, for example, were mm. built to be a certain width, who was very concerned with having um, street infrastructure that could lead from cocoa farms right um, smoothly into the kind of very rapidly expanding city of Accra. Uh, I have quite a bit of correspondence from my last archive trip from Casely Hayford on sewers <laughs> and the issues with um, kind of water and, and sewer service in Accra as it took on um, the center of gravity from the previous capital of, of Cape Coast, right down um, um, in, in the Atlantic coast also of, of present day Ghana. Uh, and there's just so much happening there with mm. literally building a future mm. and then seeing that future um, in both its most metaphysical, most cosmological dimensions, which in Casely Hayford's work are very, very pronounced, right? Mm -hmm. As this kind of um, almost messianic ambition for Fontys specifically. So this, mm -hmm. this, this, uh, a, a, a con ethnicity, a cons are really right. a kind of meta ethnicity. Often people will talk about it as an ethnicity, it, it's not, right? Um, and then was really working infrastructurally, logistically to make this the case and just looks really nothing like <laughs> present day Ghana or present day Pan-African uh, bureaucratic arrangements, even at the same time as some of the institutions that he built are still hugely prominent in present day Ghana. So the Mfansipim school, the Achimota school would be two major examples. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sense of the seeming disconnect between his, to this day, very visible, very persistent influence, and by extension, the influence of this um, um, historically contained social, intellectual, and uh, ultimately kind of sub-ethnic class, right, or mm -hmm. linguistic class, sociolinguistic class, um, and the ways in which at the same time it left no imprint. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I, so I, I, I want to muddle through that, um, and that's what this book will ultimately be about. Yeah. I mean, those visions of the future, dreams of the future um, that, you know, I'm very interested in, in, you know, how to look to the future, you know, within the space of philosophy, but also other spaces as well. But, you know, the futurism of the past and, yeah. and yes. as you yes. say, the, the successes and the, the stuff that just disappears from the face of the earth entirely. And uh, in, in African states that, you know, you, you take sort of Africanist humanistic discourse across uh, fields or disciplines. And you know, this idea that has had ample pushback now, so I don't mean to be claiming novelty here, um, that African states, as opposed to empires, um, right. somehow started in the mid 20th century. Right. And it's just not the case. So right. I, I'm, I'm profoundly interested in this African state called the Fonte Confederation um, that existed for a total of, depending on who you ask, uh, four to six years right. um, in the 1860s to 1870s. And they've got a standing army, right? They, they, they've got more or less a, a healthy fiscal situation. Um, they are really operating a kind of mini nation state, but very gladly within right. the confines of the British Empire, I would say this was, this was anti-colonial, but not anti-imperial um, in its in its orientation. And it's just gone. So it's really, <laughs> right? a, it's really a version of Afrofuturism 
projected yeah. backwards. Yeah, yeah, it, that's, I'm gonna yeah. Um, get you for a blurb when, when <laughs> Sounds it good. Yeah. comes out. Oh, I love that, I love that, that's really great. Well, we, uh, I could I could talk to you too for like hours, so uh, I'm not going to do that because uh, you know I feel like we've just gotten started on on so many interesting questions. Um, but I'd like to wrap this up, and the way I usually wrap it up um, is to is to get my my guests to think a little bit about how they bring the new generation into thinking about issues around African philosophy. And now you're not in philosophy departments; you don't teach philosophy classes per se, but um, but you know, you teach thought, right? To use Dr. Cheng's term. So, um, is there anything you do to bring students into that, or is it just like the power of the literature itself that does it for you? Whoever wants to start can start. <laughs> it's definitely your turn. <laughs> um, wow, that's a, a tough one, but I, I think, yes, I, um, I think that these these thinkers that we read are amazing writers in their own right. They are able to draw students in. So um, through immanent reading, if we read together, mm. right, um, we almost, I mean, most many students, their imaginations are sort of ignited by reading um, Suleiman Bashir Jan, or reading Eze, as Jean Marie pointed out, or reading Kwasi Wiredu, um, um, or reading this literature. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and um, it's just an amazing thing to see. Um, one of the things I, I always tell people is that I now cannot keep up with um, the amazing work that's that's emerging from the continent in African literature. Oh, well, that's, I, I, absolutely. Actually, Jean Marie is the one who helps me do it. I, <laughs> I, I try to read whatever she writes so that I can, I can then go and find the books. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that they, this, this works are, are so powerful and that they, there's a way of reading together. And yeah. so our task is to create that space, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have to. I mean, creating the space, I think in my case, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have the job I have where I mostly teach seminars, um, mm -hmm. le lectures occasionally too. But um, so getting students, you know, in a circle, quite literally, um, and putting pressure on terms together, I think is mm -hmm. how we do uh, conceptual, um, perhaps philosophical work with literary texts. So a lot of my students um, at the undergraduate level specifically, which is most of what I, I, I teach, you know, e even here, um, take my class for two reasons. One, they are just interested in Africa for oftentimes it's kind of a, a, a service reason, which is not great, you know, but it gets them in the door. Um, right. Or I have a ton of first gen African students. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, in many cases, that's the majority of my, uh, my student group and many of them don't have any real um, intimacy with knowledge traditions from the continent. Right. You know, it's a lot of STEM students. Um, the parents are busy, stuff hasn't been passed down uh, necessarily and they wanna figure out what's what. And so they come in for reasons, broadly speaking of, of, of culture, right? Sort of lowercase c. Um, and again, I don't wanna play the curmudgeon. I'm happy to have students get in the door, however way they get in the door, but all the words that they think they're coming to figure out. So <laughs> culture, identity, right, sometimes history, although not all of that often, um, I take those as the points of entry for wait a minute. Yeah. And we just go through and figure out where they feel like they are able to kind of access texts from backgrounds, context, histories. We're reading the Vuyo Rosa Chima's text on the Kukurhandi massacre right now. They know nothing about that at, at all, right? I mean, I have students who don't, it's not their fault, they're extremely smart, but they don't know what apartheid is in some cases. Mm -hmm. They've never heard of Lumumba, right? Yeah. Um, and we take familiarity as a starting point, and then we defamiliarize in good Russian formalist fashion. Yeah. Um, and at its best, that's a way of getting them to want to read more. Um, and hey, at its worst, which I'll take, it's a way of having them having done that one time in their college career. Well, it's, you know, it, it, I mean, that's very resonant, both of you, with, with uh, how I approach my own philosophy students. I mean, the first thing I tell them is, you know, you might be coming in here thinking that you're going to learn about hard words. You know, you might be thinking you're going to learn about the transcendental unity of apperception or necropolitics or, um, you know, phenomenological reductions. 
uh, we're going to look at truth and law and justice and virtue and you know all these words that you think are easy words but they're really not yeah. and we're just going to see how complicated these words actually are and 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 so that that sense of making the familiar unfamiliar i think that's the old you know anthropological um dictum i think make the familiar unfamiliar and the familiar uh, unfamiliar into the familiar um and uh, i feel like that's you know for me very much a a, a mission with my students um thank you so much for being uh, in conversation with me today this has just been great and uh, i hope i hope we have more chances to do this um Dr. Jean Marie Jackson, Dr. Omedio Cheng, um, thank you for being part of this today. And uh, I will talk to you again, hopefully soon. Thank you so much. You. I've enjoyed this immensely. Um, and I must say, I have been using these videos already in some of my own teachings. So Excellent. Much, much appreciated. Agreed. Thank you, Bruce. This is a very great resource. I've been sending people this to, to, to look at these videos. Thank you. Great. Cool. Well, see you, see you all next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>